Hello, you are now entering the infinite void. Hang on tight. We cannot save you now. Hello and welcome to this week's episode. I'm your co-host Matty. And I'm your co-host Jacob. And today's episode is part one of our new series, Crude Space Missions. So we're going to be doing this as three parts. Uh, this first part is all going to be about the past of Crude Space Missions. And then part two, the next episode, is going to be all about current Crude Space Missions. And then the final part, part three will be all about future crewed space missions where I think we'll probably go in and talk about like Mars and the moon and all of that fun stuff. But yeah, we figured it would, what better place to start with all of this than kind of at the beginning or having a look back at kind of what we've achieved because as a species, we've done quite a lot. There's been a lot of really cool advancements and a lot of really interesting well, developments. And I think mm. the last couple of years, especially since we've started this podcast, even in like the last year alone, like there's been, there seems to have been like a nice steady increase in like the amount of space launches. And there's been some really like big ones that I think have caught kind of mainstream attention with like, I remember Demo 2 when they first did that with SpaceX, that was pretty big. And was it, no, it wasn't Demo 2, was it? Or was it Crew? Uh, <laughs> it was demo i think it was i think it was demo two and then they had like crew one and recently they had that inspiration four mission which i think a lot of people kind of enjoyed especially i i very much enjoyed the netflix um documentary for that it was very cool seeing them have to like train and everything to be astronauts but yeah i think there's been a real shift in kind of like everybody getting back interested in space exploration and where it's kind of going and what we're kind of doing and there's been some huge advancements too so yeah that's kind of why we're doing this series and hopefully we might be able to shine some light on some stuff that you guys possibly didn't know because i don't know about you matty but doing the research for this episode there's a lot of stuff that kind of like took place that i wasn't really fully aware of and i, I don't know if that's just growing up in a british school and kind of being taught like more so well, Western society was getting up to but like there's a lot of cool stuff that i, I found out with like the soviet union mm -hmm. and stuff that they were doing with rockets which i thought was very interesting so yeah i think it's going to be a, a really fun series yeah i think so um and yeah the, so the soviet stuff is really cool you know if, if you just go on wikipedia and look at like space first a lot of those early firsts were done by the soviet union and mm. I, I think yeah up until obviously NASA landed someone on the moon. Arguably, um, Russia were ahead in the space race, you know, with the first satellite, first man in space, um, first living thing in space. Um, they were ahead for quite a long time. Um, but yeah, I, I guess today's episode, we're going to be starting way back in like the early days of rockets in World War II and then go into those sort of crewed missions um, in the 60s with the space race. And then I think what you said about what's happening in recent years that's that to me is sort of um this transition between the past and present is that the past up to maybe 2015 or so was dominated by nation states so mostly um usa and russia and then later on china and occasionally uk and japan uh, france canada um you know that they were the ones doing crude space missions um and then since 2015 that is like the present uh, which i'm sure we'll come on to more next time so that's you know when spacex and uh blue origin virgin galactic um start doing their stuff and brings us up to now and i'm sure over the next 10 20 years they're going to be doing more of that as it becomes quite commonplace and then i guess you know just for people to look forward to in the final episode i think the sort of future of crude space missions will be going beyond that. And I think we'll probably go back to nation states um, or perhaps even, you know, collaborations between lots of countries going off and doing uh, crude missions in the name of science to, you know, Mars and beyond mm. um, our solar system. So um, I was going to say, yeah. you've got to include your uh, SLS rocket, mate. 
Yeah. That's that's your <laughs> that's the golden egg for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think that will be sort of on the cusp of this thing. You know, yeah. it fits in the present of you know commercial yeah. space operations, but will hopefully be the launch pad to take us beyond that um, into um, sort of longer distance space flight. But should we kick off with the beginning? A few notable names and people way back in the day. Yeah. So <laughs> in good old fashioned of well, in good old fashioned infinite void, I've got a little intro here to kind of get everybody. <laughs> set and know where we're kind of oh. going so you need to get a sepia tone on the uh, video <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh yeah so space flight began in the uh, 20th century following theoretical and practical breakthroughs by Konstantin tolkovsky that you know i've been practicing that name before this so <laughs> that was successful uh, Robert H. Goddard and Herman Oberth. The first successful large-scale rocket programs were initiated in the 1920s in Germany by Fitz von Opel and Max Weyler, and eventually in Nazi Germany by Werner von Braun. The Soviet Union took the lead in the post-war space race, launching the first satellite, the first man, and the first woman in orbit, and then the United States caught up and then passed the Soviet Union rivals during the mid-1960s, landing the first man on the moon in 1969. In the same period, France, the United Kingdom, Japan, and China were concurrently developing more limited launch capabilities. So, yeah, it's pretty much kind of like what Matty said at the start. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how all of this has come from such a small period of time like when you look back throughout like human history and stuff you know like when you're just learning stuff in school about like the different civilizations that kind of cropped mm -hmm. up and all that kind of stuff like space flight is so like for me anyway it's so like techy and like mathy and like it requires so much like knowledge and data yep. and science it's just crazy how like quick it's exploded in such a small period of time because mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's just nuts because it, it's took us like so long to get to where we are. And you've like human history has always been about like all of this kind of stuff on this planet, but it's just crazy that we've managed to explode upwards in such a small period of time. But I guess it comes with the like scientific boom too, doesn't it? And the tech boom, like it all kind of happened at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, that, that early sort of 1920s to 1960s is, in the grand schemes of human history, absolutely insane. You know, we, we went from the first powered human flight, like not even rockets, like just airplanes at the turn of the century, to building rockets capable of carrying bombs, you know, 30 years later, to putting someone on the, on the moon <laughs> another 30 years later. It's absolutely insane. <laughs> it's, um, and yeah, you, you mentioned there, Werner von Braun. Um, he was, he, he sort of regarded as the sort of father of rocket technology, despite being a Nazi. Uh, <laughs> so so he, he invented um, the VT rockets for the Nazis during World War II. Um, which were the ones that were launched um, on London, so like the doodle bugs. Um, and I actually don't know what happened to him at the end of World War II. I, I, don't, I think he was given some sort of plea deal or some sort of... Um, yeah, he, know, he like went to America, didn't he? Yeah, he, he was given some sort of deal where if he gave up on the Nazis, he would be pardoned, I guess. Um, but he, he moved to America and he, he later went on, we'll come on to later, um, he was the chief architect of the Saturn V rocket, um, and mm. the Saturn V rocket, which eventually got um, humans to the moon, um, was quite heavily influenced by those early rocket designs. So, was it, there was a, there was a few, wasn't there? It wasn't just Baron Werner von Braun, was it? There was a few like Nazi scientists that yeah, that, there was quite a lot of them went um, over and joined. Yeah, um, I can't think of many off the top of my head no i, I don't he, want to he, say no, i don't want to say names just in case it weren't nazis yeah. <laughs> no he, i just i i he's like the main one isn't he yeah uh, i think there was someone involved in the i i, I think i think some were 
Nazi scientists who defected, and then some were just German scientists who yeah. fled. Um, so I said, I don't, I don't want to put, <laughs> put, na- put the names uh, on it just in case. But... Didn't um, Baron um, Werner von Braun also have that? Uh... It's like he didn't have that concept for the space hotel as well, wasn't that? Yeah, his thing. Yeah, yeah. the one with the big rotating disc. Yeah, um, that was his the artificial gravity and all he, that. Yeah, he he was um, he was well ahead of his time. You know, the, the Saturn V rocket was, you know, we're we're only just now with the space launch system building something that can sort of compete with that. It you don't really realize it but it it was 50 years ahead of its time like it, it yeah. shouldn't have been launching in the 60s like yeah um but yeah it, it was pretty uh, incredible and as I said um beginning with the v2 rockets um he made some pr- you know, very quick um developments in rocket technology um so yeah it is it is it is crazy to be honest with you how mm-hmm. quick all of that kind of like comes along. But yeah, should we kind of like move on to talk about who the first male and females were in space, maybe? Yeah, that makes sense. We'll talk about crewed space missions. We better talk about some crew. Yeah. <laughs> so first male in space, if I'm right with say, because it, it was a it it was a male first, wasn't it? Then it was a female. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the first human, I guess, in space uh, was a male and it was on April the twelfth. 1961 and it was the ussr opened the area of crewed space flight with a flight of the first cosmonaut russian name for space travelers yuri gagarin which i'm sure many people have heard of he's pretty famous and being like didn't he he logged a load of time didn't he yeah um yeah he went on to do um quite a few missions i think Mm. um yeah that first launch, incredible. Uh, so 1961, so um, ahead of the Americans, um, said pretty insane. <laughs> That's before like my parents were even born. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's a long time ago. And then I think a little bit later on that year, on August 7th, uh, you had another Soviet cosmonaut, which I'm probably going to butcher the name now, but it was <laughs> German Titov. And he became the second man in orbit during the Vostok 2 mission. And then I think you had a male and female then go up at the same time in 1963. Yeah, yeah where they launched a total of six Vostok cosmonauts. And that included a female called Valentina Tereshkovova. I want to say, but I probably messed that name up. I'm not great with Soviet names. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and she was miles ahead of anyone else. Um, I've got the list here of um, women in space. So, so June 16th, 1963. The next wasn't until uh, July 19th, 1982. So <laughs> 20 years nearly. Um, and the first American, so the third woman in space was... Um, uh, was Sally Ride on the um, fateful, um, not the fateful on um, on space shuttle? Um, so that was almost exactly thirty years, uh, twenty years after the first woman in space, June eighteenth, nineteen eighty three. Um, obviously, Sally Ride later went on uh, to die in the uh, Challenger disaster. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, Mar- Maria uh, Valentina uh, Tereshkova. Well ahead of anyone else. Miles <laughs> ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's it's nuts, really. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you had you then had the first, I guess, crewed mission. Would you say? Mm-hmm. Which was titled Project Mercury, and that was a program that was run by the United States, and it ran from 1958 all the way through 1963. I don't think. Um, it wasn't, they didn't put people up though straight away, did they? It took them a couple of years to get it all sorted. But the goal was essentially to put a man into the orbit and return them back safely and ideally do it before the Soviet Union. And I think uh, John Glenn became the first American to orbit and that was in February 20th, 1962. And that was aboard the Mercury Atlas Six. Yeah. 
so yeah, um, Mercury was NASA's sort of precursor to uh, the Apollo mission. So that was their first uh, manned spaceflight uh, missions. And Atlas Six was essentially a missile, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, an, an Atlas rocket is a missile. <laughs> so um, yeah, that that's sort of how far they came in. Um, in well, in eight or so years, they went from Atlas rockets to Saturn V. So, <laughs> which is nuts. It's yeah. all just nuts. It's it makes you think. Like for me, anyway, it's like where do ideas come from, and how do people like come up with this kind of stuff? Because mm-hmm. yeah. and like figuring out all of the like orbits and stuff. Because it's not just even about like creating a rocket that can escape Earth's gravity to get you up there. It's all mm-hmm. about like trajectories, what direction you're going in, how do you come back down? Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, a lot of yeah. It, as you say, it's not literally just <laughs> launching it. If if you look through like the list of missions and stuff, um, and and the, the next sort of missions that the US I move on to the next one was Project Gemini. So that was their follow on from Mercury and uh, Gemini was about developing a lot of their techniques that would be used on the um apollo missions it, it's things like um spacewalks and docking and um exchanging crew between capsules and all, you know all these sorts of things that are absolutely critical but you know are just never been done before and it was a case it, it's so abstract to think about because when we think about stuff being done on earth um you know pushing the boundaries of, of things on earth you know it, it's incremental and it takes a long time um yeah I'm, I'm trying to think of a good example but maybe something like um automotive industry you know really fast cars like formula one or um supercars yeah things sort of gradually progress and every year like an f1 you get like a few small changes which over the course of 10 or 20 years you know if you compare an f1 car to now to 20 years ago yeah it's a huge difference but each year there's only maybe one or two little incremental changes you know they introduce something or change something um but with these early space missions they were doing absolutely massive things every time they launched yeah. you know you, you can literally go through the list um of you know Ge- gemini 4 um was the first uh spacewalk um gemini 6 and 7 uh the first space rendezvous gemini 8 was the first space docking um it's every, every single mission they were doing something that had never been done before um that would later be you know just a small part of the um apollo mission so it is pretty insane it's <laughs> I love the names as well. You got to give it to NASA on that. They've always been great with their names. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you kind of did a good job then. So we kind of come on to the Apollo missions, don't we? Mm-hmm. And obviously Apollo 1 was the disaster, the mission that never flew, mm-hmm. where a cabin fire kind of broke out in the rehearsal test launch. Yep. I, I was listening to an interesting uh, documentary about that. And in some ways, um, Apollo 1, obviously, as, as a tragedy as it was with um, the three crew members dying, um, a lot of people think of that as a very necessary step. Um, you know, b- before Apollo 1 disaster, there was a lot of people within NASA who were concerned that you know, corners were being cut and, um, you know, in a, in a race to beat um, the Russians uh, to the moon. Um, corners are being cut and engineering principles are being sort of disregarded. Um, and the Apollo 1 sort of made them take a step back and think about stuff. Um, you know, in, in terms of the actual um, hardware itself. So I know after Apollo 1, they completely changed a lot of the sort of cabin and a lot of the fire safety protocols and stuff. But in terms of like how they approach problems and um, just took a step back and thought about um, doing things properly rather than doing things quickly. Um, so I think about Apollo One. One of the issues was the, like the door release mechanism that couldn't be opened from the inside or something like that. Um, and you take a step back, even just briefly, you think, well, that's maybe not such a good idea. But NASA in in such a rush to get this thing done, 
um, the sort of overlooked simple yeah. um, engineering principles. So, um, yeah, it was obviously a tragedy, but perhaps a necessary step um, in in the development of Apollo. So, yeah. Yeah, well, it's 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 interesting, isn't it? Because Apollo, it wasn't just going to orbit now, was it? With Apollo, it was trying to get mm-hmm. land crew with vehicles on the moon. Yeah. And the program ran from 1969 to 1972, and Apollo 8 was the first human space flight to leave Earth orbit and to orbit mm-hmm. the moon on December the 21st, 1968. Yeah. Which was cool. <laughs> I... I really can't wait to see. I know we'll we'll probably talk about this a little bit more in the next episode, but I really can't wait to see humans walk on another planet again. I'm yeah. so jealous that I didn't get to see people step on the moon for the first time. I'm totally yeah. ready for the amazing cameras that we have now. I want to see it in 4K. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't wait for it. And I, I sometimes look back at this sort of um, this stuff. Um, I think how incredible it is. Yeah. Um, well, have you seen like those videos on YouTube where they've like got like AI programs to like go and re-render it in like 4K and stuff like that? It's absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. They look yeah. so amazing with them like driving around in that buggy and stuff on the surface of the moon. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and as I said, like perhaps even more so, every single mission of this was just sort of pushing something. Yeah, you, Ian, you know, um, I've got I've got the list up here. You start with Apollo Seven, say, um, that was the first time it had launched with a crew, um, and did an orbit, and then Apollo Eight was the first uh, crewed flight sort of beyond the Earth's orbit, and then Apollo Nine was the uh, first flight of the uh, CSM and landing module. Um, and demonstrated a lot of the sort of life support systems. Apollo 10, first um, rehearsal for a lunar landing, and then obviously Apollo 11, first lunar landing. Um, and then going beyond that, you have the first of Apollo 13 in itself was <laughs> incredible, but um, that was the first doing all of the sort of life rate procedures, getting people back to Earth. And then the uh, rovers and Oh, it's, it's just insane <laughs> the technology it is it is insane especially now when you like i know it's different because obviously there's a lot it's it's more privatized now isn't it with like spacex and stuff the way that they might maybe test something like for instance with the sn mm-hmm. i don't what are they on now i know they've got they've got loads i haven't really kept up with it the last couple of weeks I've, yeah i've lost track of the numbers <laughs> but like do you know what I mean? It's it's different because for them, it's like they can produce a load because mm-hmm. like they've got the market cap really to do it. Yeah. And yeah, then like during their testing, they blew up a lot of rockets because they can <laughs> afford to do it. And their, their testing profile is, oh, we'll try some. If they don't work, we'll try again. Yeah, yeah, yeah NASA yeah, yeah. was very much like we're building some of the most expensive rockets and the world they are going to work first time so. yeah. <laughs> it's just nuts isn't it it's completely different because like like you were saying then just even looking at that like even by apollo 7 like by apollo 11 right mm-hmm. they'd got to the moon yeah. and like when you look at i know you can't make the comparison because it's like we were just saying it's two completely different ways of like mm-hmm trial and error or making stuff and creating innovation but like it's just nuts that by 11 that's where they were at because obviously it had to work each time as in comparison to like these sn i think we're like on sn 22 or something now where it's just like yeah try it if it works it doesn't matter we'll like move on to the next one and i much prefer the way now because it's obviously a lot safer and Mm -hmm. it's probably quicker like mm-hmm. you can probably get results a lot better that you want, but it is just unbelievably incredible with how quick and how, I guess, amazing. I'm not going to say lucky because it's down to the people of the time that probably really worked their ass off, mm-hmm. but it's just, it's, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. The, the, the thing to remember is that as I said, like the technology, the technology is incredible. It's insane. 
but the actual methods of doing stuff were quite rudimentary and i'm sure everyone's heard of you know your ipod has more um computing power than the uh the computers on apollo 11 that got to the moon those sorts of things but you know just even fabrication techniques you know you look at like how spacex engineer stuff and for how spacecraft are built now it's all very precise and laser mm. cutting and all sorts of stuff the engines for saturn V, the um rocketdyne f5 engines they're like they're handmade <laughs> like that they, they said like if, if we wanted to do something like this again we could never do it because it not not because we don't have the technology to do it but because we just don't have thousands of people who are like experts welders and expert machinists yeah. and you know it was built by hand you know, with every piece being bolted and welded together and you see some of like you know a, a, an, an engine of that size to gimbal and work is just stupid and it was built by hand <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's nuts it's actually nuts yeah it, like it, it listen i don't i don't think we will ever see something like it again because of the way technology has moved on and how you know things are done now we, we won't ever see anything like it again the, the closest thing that will come to it is as i said if you know a an, an f1 an F team tried to build a car without using computers and without using robots and without using anything no they just got a bunch of people in the room with you, you see the pictures of it when they're designing stuff of warehouses full of people with like plotting paper and they're just like drawing stuff out with rulers and using yeah. analog calculators and stuff to compute this stuff. Yeah, no, I know, I know, I know. It's nuts. <laughs> it's 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 actually nuts. I wonder, you know, because you were just saying there about it, like um, probably being like one of the greatest things that we ever do like mm -hmm. as a species there you go maybe that's it the ai in the future will probably look back at us and go that was the best thing that they ever biologically did apart from mm -hmm. creating us just like the pure materialistic they made something and they literally made it from nothing yeah yeah and by I, hand. I think so I, I i don't think we'll see anything like it again um, you know the, the combination of you know, the state of the world at the time, you know, the technology is available and the sort of political and social pressure to ultimately beat Russia. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it'll happen again. Um, just the amount of money involved more than anything, you know. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it, it's incredible. But saying that, actually, I'm sure we'll talk about it in the next episode. China seemed to be developing very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm sure they'll be making some leaps and bounds in some short periods of time too. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Apollo, I guess just before we move on to the next steps, you know, Apollo 17 um, was December 7th to December 19th, 1972. That's the last time um, humans set foot on another object. So nearly it'll be fit. Oh, hold on, no, I say 50 years this year since we set um, it foot on another, another body in December. So Kind of says a lot about the species, that, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Just kind of like we stopped looking outwards and we kind of looked inwards and we've just wrecked the planet's climate and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We kind of stopped yeah. having that, like, because you know how they all talk about that observer effect and everything, how you kind of come away and you see how fragile... Mm -hmm. the planet is and you realize that everything's kind of just one and all this kind of stuff it just seems like we went out and came back and it's obviously yeah. because of like financial stuff and all of that and political and all that kind of fun stuff but mm -hmm. it does suck yeah it's it's not great but But yeah, yeah, so just for the record, December 14th, 1972. So December 14th, 2022 will be 50 years. Wow, that's crazy. Your diary. <laughs> I have to have a drink. Uh, isn't the World Cup on that time this year? Oh, it is. There you go. Extra you go. fun time. <laughs> that's going to be so weird. 
but I won't tangent on that because that's a completely <laughs> different discussion. But yeah, so the next thing that kind of came after the Apollo program was the Skylab, and that was essentially to build the International Space Station, right? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, so the, Sky, fir- Sky- the first space station. Yeah, Skylab was the precursor to um, the International Space Station. And again, again, a lot of technological first, first um, thing like that we've done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because they wanted to do like. They wanted to study like solar and all that kind of stuff, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But did the, how long? How long did that last? It was because they had they put people up on it, didn't they? But I think they mm-hmm. weren't they weren't there like as long as the ISS were they? I know. They were like yeah, I, for I, I, eighty four days. Yeah, that was one. That was one mission that was. Uh... Skylab 4. I, I think there was a total of about six missions. I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, yeah, it, it was you know a few months at a time people up there for over um, I think a couple of years. Um, but yeah, Sky, Skylab itself was up there for about five years before it deorbited. So um, yeah, <laughs> actually crashed with Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, um, it's worth mentioning, I think, just at this point. Um, no, but we're going from. I was going to say, we can either move on to other space stations and look at MIR and the International Space Station, or go chronologically and go to the space shuttle. <laughs> I was I was just debating the same thing. I think that's, if I think if our listeners were listening, they would have gone, oh, <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's going on here? Jake and Matty went quiet. Because I was, I was just doing the same thing. I was looking at Space Shuttle, but then I also just saw that there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the Soviet Union as well mm-hmm. around a similar time that we should yeah. probably touch on. So I don't know. Let's maybe let's maybe do more so date timing order. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'll have that. Our notes are all in a different order. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon. I'm sure, I'm sure we had something on Mir, uh, which was the Soviet uh, space station. But I don't. I can't see that. But, <laughs> but yeah, I, I guess. I guess just to sort of summarize. It, it's worth mentioning that it, it sort of felt like, as I said, Russia was leading for a while, and the moment America put pe- uh, people on the moon. It sort of flipped very quickly and became very US led. But um yeah, yeah. The, the Russians were obviously having quite a lot of success, but so um And they've got one so, of the most successful rockets ever created. Mm-hmm. The uh the Soyuz, isn't it? Soyuz program. Yeah. Yeah, so so that they took a very different approach to the US in that the US have pursued very cutting edge designs. So Saturn V, obviously, um, the International Space Station being incredible. Um, space Shuttle, divide, we'll come on to the Space Shuttle in itself in a bit, but Space Shuttle divides opinion in that it is very, very complex, and a lot of people think the money that was spent on it could have been a lot better used um, elsewhere, but um, Space Shuttle, whereas the Soviets sort of went with this technique of um, sort of gradually building up very... I want to say very simple because it's rocket science, but you know, d- developing just capsule-based systems. So, um, way back from the stuff from before Apollo and then the Vostok program, um, and then Voshkod, which the two I'm not um, sort of massively familiar with. But then the Salyut program that was sort of their precursor to Soyuz. So that was um, that was a very successful uh, capsule. Um, that was used. Um, they, it was sort of a space station that they developed a lot of these techniques on, um, and then that brought them up to the Soyuz program, which is obviously um, still in use today. Yeah, uh, <laughs> um, it's technology that sort of had its origins back in the nineteen sixties, but it's still used today um, for resupplying um, the International Space Station. So, um, yeah, they've they sort of gone for this incremental. Let's keep it simple get it working um 
and as far as I'm aware, they've had no sort of lost trap or um, tragedy, so it's worked for them. <laughs> yeah. The the Soyu program was helped uh, helped create the Mir space station as well, didn't it? Yeah. 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 How many? God, the Soyu program must have had an incredible amount of launches because it's been around since like 1960. Yeah, uh, Soyuz. I'm just going to Google it. <laughs> Soyuz missions. Oh. I want to get this right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. Soyuz, the first one on this list um, of Soyuz 7K, uh, was launched in 1966. And um, oh, just give me a number. Um, up to 20th of December 2021, 148 launches. So, yeah. yeah. Over 50 years. <laughs> it doesn't sound like many, but I guess it's because we've been. We're used to SpaceX and their reusable rockets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. And as, as I said, a lot of those, pretty much all of those in um, the last 30 years or so have been, 20, 30 years have been um, resupply missions to the International Space Station. And then yeah. before that, uh, resupply missions to Mir. Um, yeah. So it was. Um, it was sort of um, resupplying Mir as early as 1986 was the first uh, Soyuz resupply mission to Mir. Nuts, really, isn't it? That like mm -hmm. different world powers can be like trying to achieve the same goal but not be working together. Mm -hmm. Like it's such an odd thing, like on the on the surface of it. Do you know what I mean? Like if you were walking down the street. And you saw like two insects or something like trying to get across this stream, but instead of helping each other, they were like trying to race each other over. You'd be like, guys, <laughs> going yep. about this the wrong way. Yeah. But it's 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 cool though, because at the same time it kind of just shows you how incredible like the species is without tooting our horns too much. But like it's cool that like even divided like the will the power of that whole situation was kind of just like we'll still we'll still achieve it just two separate outcomes yeah so that's interesting but yeah maybe we can go back to the space shuttle now and mm -hmm. then the international space station because i know that they are probably like yeah. the two standouts the the rare Pokemon shiny <laughs> trading cards, mm -hmm. yeah. The, the space shuttle, I, I think, is incredible. The again, the level of technology uh, that was involved in it, and I, I went to see um, the Enterprise, which was one of the, which is like the prototype version um, that they developed. And it, it flew in Earth's atmosphere, the mine space. Um, it's awesome. It's absolutely awesome. <laughs> uh, you see, mate, I've seen the real shuttle. Oh, <laughs> my! Um, my my dad took me to Kennedy Space Center when I was like twelve, and mm -hmm. it was insane. They had like slides going underneath the shuttle to like ex so you could experience the G's and everything that you would experience on the shuttle. And you got mm -hmm. to like go in there and you could touch it, and it like it was all just incredible with like the tiles and everything being like slightly burnt and everything like that. It was very cool. Yeah, yeah. but it, it, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's it's so cool. And for me, like, I also kind of see that like being. I don't know if it's like the sci-fi kid in me that's like read all of those books and stuff but for me that just kind of seems like the ideal way to kind of go like yeah. have something that can kind of like go from at I know I know it it doesn't do that in this sense because it goes on a rocket up into space and and then it comes back down into the kind of mm -hmm. thing but like for me I I see the future of being something very similar to the space shuttle but maybe it just doesn't need the rocket to take off mm -hmm. Because I just think that that whole like it's like a space plane essentially, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I just feel like that's probably the way to go. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, it is it's awesome and, and the amount of science that sort of came out of the space shuttle, you know, obviously launching Hubble and the amount of the sort of satellites that it did and um you know, a lot of those sort of missions that were it was pivotal for. Um it's it's done a lot for humanity, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then obviously it got retired then in yeah. 2011. Mm-hmm. As you were saying, a lot of people, I, I can remember actually, wasn't there like a lot of kind of like noise around whether or not it, because it was, it was a high cost thing, wasn't it? And yeah, the American government didn't want to spend that much on it mm-hmm. anymore, even though they spend a ridiculous amount of money on their military budget, <laughs> military defense budget. Yeah. But, so, so I think I was reading actually that if America spent what they spent on the uh, like the whole war in the Middle East, they could mm-hmm. have already colonized the moon and Mars. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it. <laughs> it's just nuts. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and then you kind of move on after that a little bit and we get to the international, well, the International Space Station was put up before that. But it's still in operation now. And mm-hmm. after the uh, space shuttle kind of got retired, it changed, didn't it? Because it went to, as you were saying, like the Soyuz were kind of providing astronauts and resupplies and all that kind of stuff. But in mm-hmm. recent years, it, that kind of torch has been passed over to SpaceX and... yeah other places which i'm sure we will kind of move on to talk about in part two Mm -hmm. but yeah i don't i don't think there is much else i'm hoping not anyway i'm sure a listener will message in me like you missed (laughs) this program but i think that is a pretty much a nice little 40 minute like yeah i think so yeah it gets us to the point international space station is still up there um, and we're sort of moving towards commercial resupplies of that. And I'm sure we'll see commercial space operations sort of beyond resupplies and satellites um, in yeah. the next decade or so. So, yeah. And I think I think next episode is going to be a weird one because we're going to be talking about everything we've talked about passingly mm. since we've started this podcast. But yeah. it's going to be about it as a topic. So that'll be fun. Mm-hmm. But. Yeah, if you uh, if you enjoyed this episode, guys, make sure to hit that like button if you're watching us on YouTube. And if you're not watching us on YouTube, go and watch us on YouTube as well and make sure you subscribe because we are on that road to 1,000. So every subscriber helps. So even if you don't use us for YouTube, go and subscribe because, you know, it's, it would be, it'd be really, really nice. And if you are listening on audio only, uh, please make sure that you are either following or you subscribed on that, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you consume your podcasts. And if you have any questions for the podcast or you just want to stay up to date, you can follow us on social media at Infinite Void Pod. And if you have any deeper questions or anything else that you'd like to kind of send our way, uh, you can contact us on email, which is at the infinite void podcast at gmail.com and if you want to talk to me or matty you can find me on twitter at jacob e carson and matty at the matty jmp and yeah guys we will catch you next episode for part two which will be all about current and well yeah current space crewed missions Hey everyone, we wanted to take a moment to tell you about our brand new Patreon page. Yeah, so we've devised a load of new goodies that are neatly packaged across three different tiers for you. Tiers start at £3 and go all the way up to £10 a month. Um, Just to say the Patreon is in no way an obligation and we're going to continue making the podcast as it is freely available across all the platforms. But if you'd like to support us um, and show your support, you can now. So yeah, head over to patreon.com forward slash infinite void pod for more information.